and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I want to express my heartfelt appreciation to the friends of the Democratic Governors Association assembled here tonight from across this great country. It's thanks to your help that we were able to set records last year financially. But more than that, thanks to you, we were able to tell the stories of great Democratic governors and candidates and to show that Democrats know how to address the problems that concern the American people. We know how to grow our economy, balance budgets, provide quality education for our children and health care to working men and women. That is the story of the 1994 campaigns, which, thanks to your help, we were able to tell. I want to thank the hardworking staff of the Democratic Governors Association. Katie Whalen, a very able executive director. Let's give Katie a big round of applause. Doug Richardson, Caroline Cunningham, of course, our treasurer, Mark Weiner, you heard earlier this evening. Mark, and also our finance uh, director, Eric uh, Hansen, who's here in the crowd also tonight. I'd like to compliment Governor Mel Carnahan for the wonderful event we have this evening. Mel, you're carrying on a great tradition. Let's give Governor Carnahan a big round of applause. <laughs> Governor Carnahan has shown that the Democrats are off the mat back in the arena, fighting the good fight, and will go on to electoral success this November. And when we do, it will be thanks to good leadership at the Democratic National Committee, leadership like our General Chairman, Senator Chris Dodd, who we will hear from a little bit later. Chris, thank you for coming tonight. And also, leadership from our Chairman of the Democratic National Committee, a man who has worked in the vineyards of our party for many years. In the state of South Carolina, with the Democratic National Committee, he has been there for us in good times and bad, and he will lead us back to success in 1995 and 1996. I am pleased to introduce your friend and mine, Don Fowler from the great state of South Carolina. Let's give Don a big round of applause. Good luck. Thank you. Governor By, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you that it is a wonderful privilege to be here to share this evening with you because tonight we begin a progress that will lead us to victory in 1996. Our goal between now and 1996 is to elect Democrats and elect Democrats and elect Democrats and elect Democrats, and that's what we're going to do. We have a lot of things to do between now and 1996. We have to raise money. We have to improve our technology. We have to improve the delivery of our message. And we have to present to the American people a program that they believe in that will protect our children, protect our environment, and lead us to the 20th century with the best education this world can provide. And that's what we are going to do between now and 1996. Thank you, Terry. Now, Katie Whalen told me I could speak for two minutes, and I'm going to be true to her instructions. But I want each of you to pledge that with the governors of this great nation, the members of the United States Senate, the members of the United States Congress, and our great President Bill Clinton, that we'll, we will be united financially, spiritually, in terms of issues, and we will achieve for America what America deserves, democratic victory in 1996, and thank you very much. Governor Gaston Caperton of West Virginia is our new vice chair of DGA. As vice chair, he's going to be an invaluable asset to DGA all year and will do a fabulous job as chair next year. Let me tell you something about him. Now in his second term, Gaston Caperton has been one of the most effective governors in the nation. He's bright and energetic, and he's worked hard to improve schools, health care, and the economy in his state. Gaston also was the host recently of the new Governor's Conference, and he did a great job of staging that event at the Greenbrier. Please welcome the Vice Chair of DGA, Gaston, Governor Gaston Caperton of West Virginia. Gaston.
Ladies and gentlemen, I have the great honor to introduce a man who was tired of just having himself called a senator and wanted also to be called a general. The general chairman of the Democratic Party, Chris Dodd, is a man who will lead our party in a remarkable way. So ladies and gentlemen, let this man know how much you appreciate him, not by how much you clap, but by how quiet you are when he speaks. Senator Dodd. Thank you very much, Governor. I appreciate that attention-getting introduction. My dear friends, governors, and colleagues in the House and the Senate, distinguished guests and supporters of the Democratic Governor's Dinner, I want to thank all of you for coming this evening and raising, as we have heard, a record amount to support the Democratic Governors Association. Congratulations on a great, great job, and I thank you for it. Let me also um, let you also express once again a very warm and deep sense of appreciation to Gene Carnahan for putting on another great dinner for the governors. Gene Carnahan, I know it's sitting right here. Now, I want you to know that there were many reasons on why I agreed to accept the President's offer to be the General Chairman of the Democratic National Committee for these next 21 months, not the least of which is the following. I've served in the United States Senate for 14 years, served in the majority for eight years, and I never got to be called Chairman. Today, I'm the only Democrat in Capitol Hill who gets to be called Mr. Chairman. And I thank my colleagues for it. But let me add, let me add just as quickly, in 1996, we're going to change that, and Democrats are going to be called Madam Chairman and Mr. Chairman once again with strong bipartisan support. Let me just briefly say to all of you here, I look forward to working with this association, working with Don Fowler, working with the mayors, members of the House and the Senate. For far too often, the Democratic National Committee, in my view, was a distant organization from those who were office seekers and office holders. Don Fowler and the Democratic National Committee and this United States Senator intend to change that. Henceforth, the Democratic National Committee's headquarters will be in Washington, but its heart and its soul will be in the 50 states. We're going to be listening to our governors, listening to our mayors, listening to those people who are out there every single day, working hard, trying to make the Democratic Party a stronger and a better organization. Now, let me also say to you that we need the advice and the leadership and the help of the Democratic governors, not just because you've been elected or re-elected, but some of the best ideas in this country have come out of our state capitals under the leadership of our Democratic governors. In Florida, where Governor Lawton Childs initiated Healthy Homes, this initiative has greatly expanded access to health care with market-based, managed competition approach. In North Carolina, Jim Hunt has set demanding new standards for public schools and established a Smart Start program to provide quality daycare so that every child could start school ready to learn. In Georgia, Governor Zell Miller hopes scholarships make a dream of a college education real for thousands of students across his state. And in Colorado, Roy Romer led the fight for tough, mandatory sentences for children possessing guns. 
in Vermont and Indiana, Governors Howard Dean and Evan Bayh, have the only two statewide welfare plans in the nation. Not just demonstration programs, but real online projects that are making a difference in the lives of people in their states. Democratic governors across this country are not just talking about change, they're leading the way. And they have a great partner in this effort. And this great partner is a former governor and now the President of the United States, Bill Clinton. And he knows what governors have to deal with. Let me just say to you briefly here this evening that some people now are talking a good game about deficit reduction. Under the Clinton administration for the last two years, we have seen deficits come down. Now with the third year in sight, it'll be the first time since the Truman administration that we have seen deficits decline. That's not talk, my friends. That is real action. And Governor Clinton, President Clinton, deserves the credit for it. In the area of job creation and downsizing the size of the federal government, again, it's not just talk, it's action. Something that every single Democrat in this country can be proud of. Almost six million new jobs have been created. We've seen government shrink to the size of the Kennedy administration. Again, that's not talk, that's real action. So my friends, when our Republican friends talk about what they want to do in job creation, deficit reduction, when they talk about shrinking the size of government, Democrats haven't been talking about it, we've been doing it, from the state houses to the White House, and we're going to continue on that track. So tonight, my friends, let me just make the commitment to you that in 1995, we've got some 75 mayorality races in the country, and we're going to fight in each and every one of them. We've got three governor's races, and I'm here to tell you tonight that in Louisiana, in Mississippi, and in Kentucky, Democrats are going to regain or hold our seats where we have those seats already. So I look forward to working with you. We're going to have a great year in 95, a better year in 96. The people that we represent and have fought for deserve nothing less. We'll win their support, not just because we're better at politics. We'll win it because they count on us to fight for them as they seek better jobs, a better education for their children, and a better future for their families. That's a democratic heritage. Let's get out and fight for them. If we do, they'll vote for us. Thank you. God bless. Let's look forward to working with one another. When Bill Clinton was running for president in 1992, he promised change. And he's delivered on his promises, improving the lives of Americans in countless ways. The list of achievements is long. It's impressive. 5.6 million new jobs have been created in 23 months. And we have our lowest unemployment rate in more than four years. Yay! President Clinton put in place the largest deficit-cutting plan in history, and the country's deficit will go down for the third year in a row, the first time it's done that since Harry Truman was president. the National Service Act, the Student Loan Reform Act, the Goals 2000 Education Bill, the Brady Bill, the Motor Voter Law, the Family Leave Law. All of these important measures are now the law of the land because the President pushed for them. He also fought hard for the Crime Bill, and he got it passed through Congress. 
And because of that bill, there will be 100,000 more cops on the street. Now, that's tremendously important to the security of all of us. We've got to fight to protect that bill from attacks on Capitol Hill. And now the President's turning his attention to welfare reform, real welfare reform, not a program of punishment, but a program that offers people the opportunity for self-sufficiency, the chance and the expectation that they will move from welfare to work. <laughs> to Democratic governors, Bill Clinton is a special friend and a former colleague. He's probably been to more of these DGA dinners than anyone in the room. But as president, he's been loyal to us. He has spoken at our dinner every year. He's attended the chairman's event last year in Indianapolis. He came to many of our candidates' fundraisers last year. We thank the president for his courageous work, for his continued support, and for his friendship. It gives me the greatest pleasure to bring to you the most prominent member of the Democratic Governors Association Alumni Club, a good friend, a trusted advisor, a tireless supporter of Democratic governors. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You did this to them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your enthusiasm. Chris Dodd has that effect on everyone. Governor Carnahan and Gene, thank you very much for your service here and for your success tonight. I really would like to say a special word of thanks to my neighbor, Mel Carnahan. He helped me when I ran for president. He helped me even when he was in the midst of a tough primary, when it could have done him no good at all to be for anybody running for president. Uh, but he survived me, and he got elected. And then I got elected. We've worked together fighting floods, reforming welfare, doing a lot of things. And I am honored to be his friend and his partner. I want to say a, a special word of appreciation, too, to the DGA Vice Chair, Governor Caperton, and Rachel, I have been their friends a long time, and I'm looking forward to working with them. I also want to say a personal word of appreciation to your outgoing Chair, Evan Bayh, and to Susan. They did unbelievable work with the help of a lot of you in a very, very difficult year, and I will never forget all the efforts Evan Bayh made. And, uh, you know, where I grew up, we always say it's a long road that doesn't turn, and 
when the road turns, don't forget that Evan Bayh was there for us when it was tough, and he did his part. I thank Katie Whalen and Mark Weiner for the wonderful work that they have done for the DGA. They have really been terrific. I'm sure glad to see all of you. And you're so quiet. You know, over uh, New Year's, I was talking to a lot of interesting people, and a lady came up to me who was a college president and said, she said, you know, I really identify with you. Being president's just like running a cemetery. There's a lot of people under you, but nobody's listening. <laughs> and, uh, well, I had that feeling for the last couple of years from time to time, but I think that also is beginning to change. Lord knows I gave it a good test last Tuesday night in the State of the Union. <laughs> and uh, the... Uh, <laughs> And it turned out the American people were listening. I want to express my appreciation also to Chris Dodd and to Don Fowler, to Debbie DeLee, for leading our Democratic Party. I, I thank Chris and Don especially for being willing to come on at this time and to help us remember who we are and why we are Democrats and what it is we're supposed to do now. And I think they have done a wonderful job of it. You know, there are days when I really miss being a governor. <laughs> I, uh, I loved it. I mean, you, it was, we also had public housing and, <laughs> and security. And people called us by something other than our first names. <laughs> but nobody ever sprayed the front of the governor's mansion with an assault weapon. <laughs> or tried to land a plane in my backyard. <laughs> I, uh... But most days, I am profoundly happy to have the chance to wage these battles. And every day, I am honored for the opportunity and the obligation to do it. You know, it's kind of fashionable now for our colleagues in the other party to quote Franklin Roosevelt. They like his words, you know, it's optimism and hope and everything. And when they do it, they have a little spin on it. They say, now, Roosevelt was the right person for his time, and the Democrats were right for their time. If you really read between the lines, they basically say, okay, okay, everything that was worth doing in the 20th century, the Democrats did. I agree with that. But, uh, but, but their line is something like, uh, well, the reason that's so is that in the 20th century, we had an industrial age dominated by large, powerful organizations and we needed a Democratic Party that was the party of national government to protect the common people and the little children and the elderly and others from abuse by large private organizations. But in the 21st century, the world will be very different. It will be uh, more rapidly changing, more entrepreneurial, less bureaucratic. The age of the PC, not the mainframe. You've heard all that stuff. And therefore, we don't need the Democrats anymore. They're an anachronism. But we like Roosevelt's words. Well, I say to them, I know the world is changing. And I know we need to reduce the size and reach of much of the federal government's activities. Matter of fact, we started that. We're glad to have their help in going forward with it. But the issue facing America is the issue that has faced America from the beginning, and certainly the issue that has faced America repeatedly in the 20th century as we stand at the dawn of a new era. It is still, can we really guarantee the American dream for all Americans willing to work for it? And can we find ways with all of our incredible differences 
to come together as a people to do what we have to do. If you go back through the 219 years of American history, since the issuance of the Declaration of Independence, you find those challenges over and over and over again. Will we do what it takes to expand the American dream and keep it alive for all of our people? And can we find a way with all of our differences to come together? Because we know that's the only way we're ever profoundly strong. And I say to you that there is still something for the Democratic Party to do. If the Consider, consider the differences in their contract and our covenant. Consider what is good about what they want to do, what is good about what we want to do, and what is sort of open to question. And you will see where we should go. Because there is no question that if we really want to guarantee the American dream in this new economy for all of our people. What we have to do is to empower people to make the most of their own lives, to find a way to continue to enhance opportunity even as we shrink the bureaucracy, and to strengthen our sense of citizenship and community as a fundamental condition of America's security, opportunity, and responsibility. Yes, 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 we must change the government. Yes, we have to shrink it. There's 100,000 fewer people working for the federal government than there were on the day I became president. And there'll be another 170,000 more leaving if no new laws are passed by this Congress. But what about empowerment? Which party wanted family and medical leave? Which party wanted to immunize all the children in this country against serious disease? Which party said we can't afford to keep wasting money on the college loan program? Let's cut the cost of it, make it available to more Americans, and make it cheaper for students. The Democratic Party did that. Yes, we should reduce the tax burden on people that are paying all they can afford. You know, that's the only secret I kept from the press in the last two years. We cut taxes on 15 million working families, kept it a total secret from the American people. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out how we did it, but it's not too late to let them know. I, yes, we have to do better, but there is the right way to do it. Our middle class Bill of Rights could more properly be called a Bill of Rights and Responsibilities because you can't get the tax break unless you're trying to raise your kids or educate them or educate yourselves or take care of your families. In other words, we reward by reducing the tax burden people who are carrying on the work of citizenship and making the country stronger for everybody. We lower people's taxes and raise their income in the short run in a way that will also raise their income in the long run. That's why we ought to have a tax deduction for education costs after high school. That's why we ought to have an IRA that can be drawn on for education or health care or care of an elderly parent. That's why we ought to lower the cost of raising young children. That's why we ought to collapse all these terrible uh, plethora of programs and instead of letting people sign up for a government program, give them a check worth cash that they can take to the local community college when they're unemployed or they need job training. Yes, we have some good ideas. Let's cut the taxes, but let's do it in a way that raises the economic power of America in the long run and helps middle class families to build their lives. And while we're at it, let's not forget that the last time the country got in a total fever over tax cutting, we overdid it and we wound up with a terrible burden. And the Democrats are not blameless because then there was a Republican president and a Democratic Congress. And when power is divided, one of two things can happen. You can either share the responsibility and say both have to be responsible and move forward, or you can point the finger of blame and hope that everybody can escape responsibility. Well, we tried it the second way, folks, and it didn't work out very well. 
When you make out your checks to the federal government to pay taxes in April, remember this. Interest payments on the federal debt will require the um, amount equal to 36% of your personal income tax and 27% of it, 27 cents, more than a quarter of every dollar you pay to the federal government in personal income taxes will be required to pay interest on the debt run up between 1981 and the day I became president. So yeah, it's okay to cut taxes if we do it in the right way, but let's pay for these tax cuts with spending cuts. Let's don't put more debt on our children and more burdens in that budget. So we have an agenda to empower people, pass the middle class bill of rights, and raise the minimum wage and reform the welfare system so people can go to work. And we have an agenda to reduce government more. The vice president's coming back with another round of reinventing government. And we're going to make it smaller, and we're going to have it do better. Look at the way the emergency management programs work now. I just talked to the home builders today in Houston. And I reminded them that Henry Cisnero, since he's been head of the Housing and Urban Development Department, has reduced the size of that department by 10 percent, eliminated all the regional offices, and cut the time for loan processing from four to six weeks down to three to five days. That's a democratic way of reinventing government that serves better with less. You can say, well, maybe this won't work. Well, maybe it won't, but it's worked pretty well for two years. We have almost six million jobs, more than we had two years ago. We've reduced the debt on our families by over $600 billion, about $10,000 a family. We've seen in the last week that 1994 was our best year economically in terms of growth and in terms of personal income increases in 10 years. And, and we also had the lowest combined rates of inflation and unemployment, what President Reagan used to call the misery index, it was the lowest in 1994, it's been in 25 years. But we have a long way to go because we all know that our rising tide's not lifting all boats. We know that a lot of people are not doing better economically. We all know there are still challenges ahead. But let's keep our eye on the goal. What's best for the American people? Empower them to compete and win. Do what we can to give them a government that offers more opportunity with less bureaucracy. And finally, let's not forget that for those who are willing to be responsible, this country is best when it works together, when there's a sense of partnership, a sense of citizenship, a sense of community. We have worked with innovative governors in this room and their predecessors in health care and welfare reform. We've worked with governors like Governor Childs, Governor Kitzhaber, Governor Dean on health care reform. And we're not through with that issue. We plead guilty to wanting to get the 40 million Americans, most of them in working families, who can't have health insurance. We think we ought to have it for them. And we think there must be a way to do it that all Americans can agree on. We feel we. <laughs> we plead guilty to believing that when people change jobs, they ought not to lose their family's health insurance. We believe that. That's what we believe. And we can do these things in ways that build our community. Watch the debate on welfare reform. Should we require responsibility? You bet we should. Should we just give people a check forever and a day, no matter how they behave or what they do? No, we shouldn't. No, we shouldn't. But the focus ought to be on liberating people 
moving them from welfare to work, moving them from having children to being the best possible parents. It should not be on punishing people because they're poor or because they made a mistake. If that were the criteria, a bunch of us were once poor and all of us had made mistakes. And none of us want to be punished for either one. So, so let us approach this welfare debate with a sense of excitement and determination, but also a little bit of humility. If anyone knew the answer to this problem, it would have been fixed by now. But the welfare debate embodies all the things that are going on in our culture now. Our worry that government doesn't give us our money's worth. Our fear that our profoundest problems are really cultural, not political or economic, that, that something is amiss in our society and we've got to get our values right again. Our deep understanding that we don't really have anybody to waste and when people aren't being as productive as they ought to be, it hurts the rest of us and our economic future as well. All of this is there in this debate. Now, Saturday, we had a very good meeting with Republicans and Democrats from the Congress, from the governors, from the local governments around the country. And on Friday, I got ready for that meeting by spending an hour with four women who had worked their way off welfare. And I'm telling you, what I heard Friday is what I have heard now for 15 years. The people who know how broke the system is best are those who've been on it, who've been trapped by it, who regret it, who've resented it, who struggled and worked and slaved to get out of it. It is that that we should tap into. We are the party of change. We brought the deficit down. We reduced the size of the government. We put welfare reform and health care reform and aggressive, expansive trade on the world's agenda and on America's agenda. It was our administration that first had a commerce secretary like Ron Brown that went around selling American products all over the world, not the Republicans. So I say, let's extend the hand of partnership to those in the other party. Let's say, we hear you. You want to reduce the size of government? You want to reduce regulation? You want to give more authority to the states? You want to privatize those things which can be privatized? So do we. But our contract is a covenant. We want to create opportunity, not just bash government. We want children to have a future, no matter where they come from, what their roots are, what their disabilities are by virtue of their birth. We believe that America works best when everybody's got a chance at the brass ring. That is our credo, and it will always be. And that's why the Democrats are coming back. Thank you, and God bless you all.